Mr. Barton, although he had laterally begun to earn for himself the character of a hypochondriac, was yet very far from deserving it. Though by no means lively, he had yet, naturally, what are termed even spirits, and was not subject to undue depressions. He soon, therefore, began to return to his former habits, and one of the earliest symptoms of this healthier tone of spirits was his appearing at a grand dinner of the Freemasons, of which worthy fraternity he was himself a brother. Barton, who had been at first gloomy and abstracted, drank much more freely than was his wont, possibly with the purpose of dispelling his own secret anxieties, and under the influence of good wine and pleasant company, became gradually, unlike himself, talkative and even noisy. It was under this unwanted excitement that he left his company at about half past ten o'clock, and, as conviviality is a strong incentive to gallantry, it occurred to him to proceed forthwith to Lady Rochdale's, and pass the remainder of the evening with her and his destined bride. Accordingly, he was soon chatting gaily with the ladies. It is not to be supposed that Captain Barton had exceeded the limits which propriety prescribes to good fellowship. He had merely taken enough wine to raise his spirits, without, however, in the least degree unsteadying his mind or affecting his manners. With this undue elevation of spirits had supervened an entire oblivion or contempt of those undefined apprehensions which had for so long weighed upon his mind, and to a certain extent, estranged him from society. But as the night wore away and his artificial gaiety began to flag, these painful feelings gradually intruded themselves again, and he grew abstracted and anxious as heretofore. He took his leave at length with an unpleasant foreboding of some coming mischief, and with a mind haunted with a thousand mysterious apprehensions such as, even while he acutely felt their pressure, he nevertheless inwardly strove or affected to contempt. It was this proud defiance of what he regarded as his own weakness which prompted him upon the present occasion to that course which brought about the adventure I am now about to relate. Mr. Barton might have easily called a coach, but he was conscious that a strong inclination to do so proceeded from no cause other than what he desperately persisted in representing to himself to be his own superstitious tremors. He might also have returned home by a route different from that against which he had been warmed by his mysterious correspondent, but for the same reason he dismissed this idea also, and with a dogged and half-desperate resolution to force matters to a crisis of some kind, if there were any reality in the causes of his former suffering, and if not, satisfactorily to bring their delusiveness to the proof. He determined to follow precisely the course which he had trodden upon the night so painfully memorable in his own mind as that on which his strange persecution commenced. Though, sooth to say, the pilot who for the first time steers his vessel under the muzzles of a hostile battery never felt his resolution more severely tasked then did Captain Barton, as he breathlessly pursued this solitary path, a path which, spite of every effort of scepticism and reason, he felt to be infested by some malignant being. He pursued his way steadily and rapidly, scarcely breathing from intensity of suspense. He, however, was troubled by no renewal of the dreaded footsteps, and was beginning to feel a return of confidence as more than three-fourths of the way being accomplished with impunity, he approached the long line of twinkling oil lamps which indicated the frequented streets. This feeling of self-congratulation was, however, but momentary. The report of a musket at some hundred yards behind him, and the whistle of a bullet close to his head, disagreeably and startlingly dispelled it. His first impulse was to retrace his steps in pursuit of the assassin, but the road on either side was, as we have said, embarrassed by the foundations of a street beyond which extended waste fields full of rubbish and neglected lime and brick kilns, and all now as utterly silent as though no sound had ever disturbed their dark and unsightly solitude. The futility of single-handed, attempting under such circumstances a search for the murderer 
was apparent, especially as no sound, either of retreating steps or any other kind, was audible to direct his pursuit. With the tumultuous sensations of one whose life has just been exposed to a murderous attempt, and whose escape has been the narrowest possible, Captain Barton turned again, and without however quickening his pace actually to a run, hurriedly pursued his way. He had turned, as I have said, after a pause of a few seconds, and had just commenced his rapid retreat, when on a sudden he met the well-remembered little man in the fur cap. The encounter was but momentary. The figure was walking at the same exaggerated pace, and with the same strange air of menace as before. And as it passed him, he thought he heard it say in a furious whisper, Still alive! Still alive! The state of Mr. Barton's spirits began now to work a corresponding alteration in his health and looks, and to such a degree that it was impossible that the change should escape general remark. For some reasons known but to himself, he took no steps whatsoever to bring the attempt upon his life which he had so narrowly escaped under the notice of the authorities. On the contrary, he kept it jealously to himself and it was not for many weeks after the occurrence that he mentioned it, and then in strict confidence to a gentleman whom the torments of his mind at last compelled him to consult. Spite of his blue devils, however, poor Barton, having no satisfactory reason to render to the public for any undue remissness in the attentions exacted by the relation existing between him and Miss Montague, was obliged to exert himself and present to the world a confident and cheerful bearing. The true source of his sufferings, and every circumstance connected with them, he guarded with a reserve so jealous that it seemed dictated by at least a suspicion that the origin of his strange persecution was known to himself, and that it was of a nature which, upon his own account, he could not or dared not disclose. The mind thus turned in upon itself, and constantly occupied with a haunting anxiety which it dared not reveal or confide to any human breast became daily more excited, and, of course, more vividly impressible by a system of attack which operated through the nervous system. And in this state, he was destined to sustain, with increasing frequency, the stealthy visitations of that apparition from which the first had seemed to possess so terrible a hold upon his imagination. It was about this time that Captain Barton called upon the then celebrated preacher, Dr. Macklin, with whom he had a slight acquaintance, and an extraordinary conversation ensued. The divine was seated in his chambers in college, surrounded with works upon his favourite pursuit, and deep in theology, when Barton was announced. There was something at once embarrassed and excited in his manner, which along with his wan and haggard countenance, impressed the student with the unpleasant consciousness that his visitor must have recently suffered terribly indeed to account for an alteration so striking, almost shocking. After the usual interchange of polite greeting and a few commonplace remarks, Captain Barton, who obviously perceived the surprise which his visit had excited and which Dr. Macklin was unable wholly to conceal, interrupted a brief pause by remarking, This is a strange call, Dr. Macklin, perhaps scarcely warranted by an acquaintance so slight as mine with you. I should not under ordinary circumstances have ventured to disturb you, but my visit is neither an idle nor impertinent intrusion. I am sure you will not so account it when I tell you how afflicted I am. Dr. Macklin interrupted him with assurances, such as good breeding suggested, and Barton resumed. I am come to task your patience by asking your advice. When I say your patience, I might indeed say more. I might have said your humanity, your compassion, for I have been and am a great sufferer. My dear sir, replied the churchman, it will indeed afford me infinite gratification if I can give you comfort in any distress of mind. But, you know, I know what you would say, resumed Barton quickly. I am an unbeliever, and therefore incapable of deriving help from religion. But don't take that for granted. At least you must not assume that however unsettled my convictions may be, I do not feel a deep, 
a very deep interest in the subject. Circumstances have lately forced it upon my attention in such a way as to compel me to review the whole question in a more candid and teachable spirit, I believe, than I have ever studied it in before. Your difficulties, I take it for granted, refer to the evidences of revelation, suggested the clergyman. Why no, not altogether. In fact, I am ashamed to say I have not considered even my objections sufficiently to state them connectedly. But, but there is one subject in which I feel a peculiar interest. He paused again and Dr. Macklin pressed him to proceed. The fact is, said Barton, whatever may be my uncertainty as to the authenticity of what we are taught to call revelation, of one fact I am deeply and horribly convinced, that there does exist beyond this spiritual world a system whose workings are generally in mercy hidden from us, a system which may be and which is sometimes partially and terribly revealed. I am sure, I know, continued Barton with increasing excitement, that there is a God, a dreadful God, and that retribution follows guilt in ways the most mysterious and stupendous, by agencies the most inexplicable and terrific. There is a spiritual system. Great God, how I have been convinced. A system malignant and implacable and omnipotent, under whose persecutions I am and have been suffering the torments of the damned. Yes, sir, yes, the fires and frenzy of hell. As Barton spoke, his agitation became so vehement that the divine was shocked and even alarmed. The wild and excited rapidity with which he spoke, and above all, the indefinable horror that stamped his features, afforded a contrast to his ordinary cool and unimpassioned self-possession, striking and painful in the last degree. My dear sir, said Dr. Macklin after a brief pause, I fear you have been very unhappy indeed but I venture to predict that the depression under which you labour will be found to originate in purely physical causes, and the aid of a few tonics, your spirits will return, and the tone of your mind be once more cheerful and tranquil as heretofore. There was, after all, more truth than we are quite willing to admit in the classic theories which assigns the undue predominance of any one affection of the mind to the undue action or torpidity of one or other of our bodily organs. Believe me, that a little attention to diet, exercise, and the other essentials of health under competent direction will make you as much yourself as you can wish. Dr. Macklin, said Barton with something like a shudder, I cannot delude myself with such a hope. I have no hope to cling to but one, and that is, that by some other spiritual agency more potent than that which tortures me, it may be combated and I delivered. If this may not be, I am lost, now and forever lost. But Mr. Barton, you must remember, urged his companion, that others have suffered as you have done, and no, 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 interrupted he with irritability. No, sir, I am not a credulous, far from a superstitious man. I have been, perhaps too much the reverse, too sceptical, too slow of belief but unless I were one whom no amount of evidence could convince, unless I were to contemn the repeated, the perpetual evidence of my own senses, I am now, now at last constrained to believe. I have no escape from the conviction, the overwhelming certainty, that I am haunted and dogged, go where I may, by, by a demon. There was a pre-natural energy of horror in Barton's face, as with its damp and death-like lineaments turned towards his companion, he thus delivered himself. God help you, my poor friend, said Dr. Macklin, much shocked. God help you, for indeed you are a sufferer, however your sufferings may have been caused. Aye, aye, God help me, echoed Barton sternly. But will he help me? Will he help me? Pray to him. Pray in a humble and trusting spirit, said he. Pray, pray, echoed he again. I can't pray. I could as easily move a mountain by an effort of my will. I have not belief enough to pray. 
There is something within me that will not pray. You prescribe impossibilities, literal impossibilities. You will not find it so, if you will but try, said Dr. Macklin. Try? I have tried, and the attempt only fills me with confusion, and sometimes terror. I have tried in vain, and more than in vain. The awful, unutterable idea of eternity and infinity oppresses and maddens my brain whenever my mind approaches the contemplation of the Creator. I recoil from the effort scared, I tell you, Dr. Macklin. If I am to be saved, it must be by other means. The idea of an eternal Creator is to me intolerable. My minds cannot support it. Say then, my dear sir, urged he, say how you would have me serve you, what you would learn of me, what I can do or say to relieve you. Listen to me first, replied Captain Barton, with a subdued air and an effort to suppress his excitement. Listen to me while I detail the circumstances of the persecution under which my life has become all but intolerable. A persecution which has made me fear death and the world beyond the grave as much as I have grown to hate existence. Barton then proceeded to relate the circumstances which I have already detailed and then continued. This has now become habitual, an accustomed thing. I do not mean the actual seeing him in the flesh. Thank God that at least is not permitted daily. Thank God from the ineffable horrors of that visitation I have been mercifully allowed intervals of repose, though none of security. But from the consciousness that a malignant spirit is following and watching me wherever I go, I have never for a single instant a temporary respite. I am pursued with blasphemies, cries of despair and appalling hatred. I hear those dreadful sounds called after me as I turn the corners of the streets. They come in the night time while I sit in my chamber alone. They haunt me everywhere, charging me with hideous crimes and, great God, threatening me with coming vengeance and eternal misery. Hush, do you hear that? He cried with a horrible smile of triumph. There, there, will that convince you? The clergyman felt a chill of horror steal over him, while during the wail of a sudden gust of wind, he heard, or fancied he heard, the half-articulate sounds of rage and derision mingling in the sow. Well, what do you think of that? At length Barton cried, drawing a long breath through his teeth. I heard the wind, said Dr. Macklin. What should I think of it? What is there remarkable about it? The prince of the powers of the air, muttered Barton with a shudder. Tut, tut, my dear sir, said the student, with an effort to reassure himself, for though it was broad daylight, there was nevertheless something disagreeably contagious in the nervous excitement under which his visitor so miserably suffered. You must not give way to those wild fancies. You must resist these impulses of the imagination. Ay, ay, resist the devil and he will flee from thee, said Barton in the same tone. But how resist him? Ay, there it is! There is the rub! What? What am I to do? What can I do? My dear sir, this is fancy, said the man of folios. You are your own tormentor. No, no, sir. Fancy has no part in it, answered Barton somewhat sternly. Fancy! Was it that made you as well as me here, but this moment, those accents of hell? Fancy indeed! No, no, no. But you have seen this person frequently, said the ecclesiastic. Why have you not accosted or secured him? Is it not a little precipitate to say no more, to assume as you have done, the existence of a preternatural agency, when after all, everything may be easily accountable if only proper means were taken to sift the matter. There are circumstances connected with this, this appearance, said Barton, which is needless to disclose, but which to me are proofs of its horrible nature. I know that the being that follows me is not human. I say I know this. I could prove it to your own conviction. He paused for a minute and then added, and as to accosting it, I dare not. I could not. When I see it, I am powerless. I stand in the gaze of death, 
in the triumphant presence of infernal power and malignity. My strength and faculties and memory all forsake me. O oh God, I fear, sir, you know not what you speak of. Mercy, mercy, heaven have pity on me. Dr. Macklin, he said abruptly raising himself and looking full upon the clergyman with an imploring eye. I know you will do for me whatever may be done. You know now fully the circumstances and the nature of my affliction. I tell you I cannot help myself. I cannot hope to escape. I am utterly passive. I conjure you then to weigh my case well, and if anything may be done for me by vicarious supplication, by the intercession of the good, or by any aid or influence whatsoever, I implore of you. I adjure you in the name of the Most High. Give me the benefit of that influence. Deliver me from the body of this death. Strive for me. Pity me. I know you will. You cannot refuse this. It is the purpose and object of my visit. Send me away with some hope, however little, some faint hope of ultimate deliverance, and I will nerve myself to endure, from hour to hour, the hideous dream into which my existence has been transformed. Dr. Macklin assured him that all he could do was to pray earnestly for him, and that so much he would not fail to do. They parted with a hurried and melancholy valediction. Barton hastened to the carriage that awaited him at the door, drew down the blinds and drove away, while Dr. Macklin returned to his chamber to ruminate at leisure upon the strange interview which had just interrupted his studies. It was not to be expected that Captain Barton's changed and eccentric habits should long escape remark and discussion. Various were the theories suggested to account for it. Some attributed the alteration to the pressure of secret pecuniary embarrassments, others to a repugnance to fulfil an engagement into which he was presumed to have too precipitately entered, and others, again, to the supposed incipiency of mental disease, which latter, indeed, was the most plausible, as well as the most generally received, of the hypotheses circulated in the gossip of the day. From the very commencement of this change, at first so gradual in its advances, Miss Montague had of course been aware of it. The intimacy involved in their peculiar relation, as well as the near interest which it inspired afforded, in her case, a like opportunity and motive for the successful exercise of that keen and penetrating observation peculiar to her sex. His visits became, at length, so interrupted and his manner, while they lasted, so abstracted, strange and agitated, that Lady Rochdale, after hinting her anxiety and her suspicions more than once, at length distinctly stated her anxiety and pressed for an explanation. The explanation was given, and although its nature at first relieved the worst solicitudes of the old lady and her niece, yet the circumstances which attended it and the really dreadful consequences which it obviously indicated, as regarded the spirits, and indeed the reason of the now wretched man, who made the strange declaration, were enough upon little reflection to fill their minds with perturbation and alarm. General Montague, the young lady's father, at length arrived. He had himself slightly known Barton, some ten or twelve years previously, and being aware of his fortune and connections, was disposed to regard him as an exceptional and indeed a most desirable match for his daughter. He laughed at the story of Barton's supernatural visitations and lost no time in calling upon his intended son-in-law. My dear Barton, he continued gaily after a little conversation, and my sister tells me that you are a victim to blue devils in quite a new and original shape. Barton changed countenance and sighed profoundly. Come, come, I protest this will never do, continued the general. You are more like a man on his way to the gallows than to the altar. These devils have made quite a saint of you. Barton made an effort to change the conversation. No, no, it won't do, said his visitor laughing. I am resolved to say what I have to say upon this magnificent mock mystery of yours. You must not be angry. But really, it is too bad to see you at your time of life, 
absolutely frightened into good behaviour like a naughty child by a bugaboo. And as far as I can learn, a very contemptible one. Seriously, I have been a good deal annoyed at what they tell me, but at the same time, thoroughly convinced that there is nothing in the matter that may not be cleared up with a little attention and management, within a week at furthest. Ah, uh, General, you do not know, he began. Yes, but I do know quite enough to warrant my confidence, interrupted the soldier. Don't I know that all your annoyance proceeds from the occasional appearance of a certain little man in a cap and a greatcoat with a red vest and a bad face who follows you about and pops upon you at corners of lanes and throws you into ague fits. Now, my dear fellow, I'll make it my business to catch this mischievous little mountebank and either beat him to a jelly with my own hands or have him whipped through the town at the cart's tail before a month passes. If you knew what I knew, said Barton with gloomy agitation, you would speak very differently. Don't imagine that I am so weak as to assume, without proof the most overwhelming, the conclusion to which I have been forced. The proofs are here, locked up here. As he spoke, he tapped upon his breast, and with an anxious sigh, continued to walk up and down the room. Well, well, Barton, said his visitor. I'll wager a rump and a dozen, I collar the ghost, and convince even you before many days are over. He was running on in the same strain when he was suddenly arrested and not a little shocked by observing Barton, who had approached the window, stagger slowly back like one who had received a stunning blow. His arm extended towards the street, his face and his very lips white as ashes, while he muttered, There! By heaven! There! There! General Montague started mechanically to his feet and from the window of the drawing room saw a figure corresponding as well as his hurry would permit him to discern with the description of the person whose appearance so persistently disturbed the repose of his friend. The figure was just turning from the rails of the area upon which it had been leaning and without waiting to see more the old gentleman snatched his cane and hat and rushed down the stairs and into the street in the furious hope of securing the person and punishing the audacity of the mysterious stranger. He looked round him, but in vain, for any trace of the person he had himself distinctly seen. He ran breathlessly to the nearest corner, expecting to see from thence the retiring figure, but no such form was visible. Back and forward, from crossing to crossing, he ran at fault, and it was not until the curious gaze and laughing countenances of the passers-by reminded him of the absurdity of his pursuit, that he checked his hurried pace, lowered his walking cane from the menacing altitude which he had mechanically given it, adjusted his hat, and walked composedly back again, inwardly vexed and flurried. He found Barton pale and trembling in every joint. They both remained silent, though under emotions very different. At last Barton whispered, You saw it. It? Him? Someone, you mean. To be sure I did, replied Montague testily. But where is the good or the harm of seeing him? The fellow runs like a lamplighter. I wanted to catch him, but he had stolen away before I could reach the hall door. However, it is no great matter. Next time, I dare say, I'll do better, and egad, if I once come within reach of him, I'll introduce his shoulders to the weight of my cane. Notwithstanding General Montague's undertakings and exhortations, however, Barton continued to suffer from the self-same unexplained cause. Go how, when, or where he would, he was still constantly dogged or confronted by the being who had established over him so horrible an influence. Nowhere and at no time was he secure against the odious appearance which haunted him with such diabolic perseverance. His depression, misery and excitement became more settled and alarming every day and the mental agonies that ceaselessly preyed upon him began at last so sensibly to affect his health that Lady Rochdale and General Montague succeeded, without indeed much difficulty, 
in persuading him to try a short tour on the continent in the hope that an entire change of scene would, at all events, have the effect of breaking through the influences of local association which the more sceptical of his friends assumed to be by no means inoperative in suggesting and perpetuating what they conceived to be a mere form of nervous illusion. General Montague indeed was persuaded that the figure which haunted his intended son-in-law was by no means a creation of his imagination, but on the contrary, a substantial form of flesh and blood animated by a resolution, perhaps with some murderous object in perspective, to watch and follow the unfortunate gentleman. Even this hypothesis was not a very pleasant one, yet it was plain that if Barton could ever be convinced that there was nothing preternatural in the phenomenon with which he had hitherto regarded in that light, the affair would lose all its terrors in his eyes, and wholly cease to exercise upon his health and spirits the baleful influence which it has hitherto done. He therefore reasoned that if the annoyance were actually escaped by mere locomotion and change of scene, it obviously could not have originated in any supernatural agency. <laughs> <laughs>